Well, good morning, church. It's great to be gathered together once again to worship the living God, the one that has redeemed us, has saved us, has made us free. We have one announcement from the deacons, from Mr. Brian Akers. Well, it's sort of two. Um, I am now the chairman of the deacons, and that's a cool position. That's yeah, the first time for me, so... Some of the duties of that, one is that we're working on a letter that's going to be coming out to you. And we really want you to understand the deacon's heart is truly to be a servant of the church, the servant of you, the members. So we are there to help you connect to the church in any way possible. So as these letters come out, understand that that letter is just an introduction and a beginning of our service for this year. Um, the second thing I get to do today is tell you about Pastor Appreciation Day. So just for today, we got to appreciate our pastors. Not really. Um, but today, I want to give a small token that comes from the deacon budget as a treasurer, I'll tell you that. Um, so basically, <laughs> um, what, what's an honor to do is when you be, get to fulfill um, some fun stuff. So it's good. I so like to invite by Pastor Matt, and then Becky's not here today, but we would be giving Becky a gift also. Also like Pastor Anthony, if Kenzie can come up, you're, you're, welcome to, you're welcome to, or if you want to wave, it's okay. And then our pastoral apprentice is also here, Jason and his wife, Patty Lynn. So, so what, we, what I try to do is put together things based on sermons. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Matt said it'd be really nice to have a cup of coffee. And then if you threw in a Danish, it would be great. <laughs> Danish. All right, so. Pastor Matt tells us in his sermons that he likes Boston Creams. So here's Boston cream. <laughs> Anthony and Jason don't mention food. So they get, they get one Boston cream and a regular glaze, which and I, I do have other presents, too. So I, I, in here is um, a gift card that doesn't charge a fee. It's called money. Um, <laughs> and uh, sorry. <laughs> um, and that is for them to, to um, understand that we love you and use that to bless your family. And then the other thing would be a Starbucks gift card for our pastors and pastor apprentice, and then a Duncan gift cards for their wives. So they've always mentioned that the guys get to go out together and have coffee, but now the girls are funded for that. So we look forward to you guys enjoying and hearing stories. Um, please love on our pastors. I want to read a couple of verses while they're up here. Um, the first one is, um, need glasses nowadays. Right, it's from Ephesians 4.11. says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the statue of the, of the fullness of Christ. Titus 1.9, it says, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. So that our pastors are, should be hold firm to the trustworthy word, word as taught, so that we may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine, also to rebuke those who contradict it. And then finally, in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, it says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a, as a fellow elder, which is from Peter, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the sh chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Uh, we praise God for you and really appreciate you, you, you and your ministries here at North Harbor Baptist Church. Thank you. So if the sermon goes long and you see me pulling this out, I'm just gaining some energy. I'll keep going. If, yeah, when the sermon goes long, <laughs> I know I'll hear Matt's opening up in the middle of my sermon. Just... Well, thank you, church. Thank you, Brian and the deacons. Uh, we we tr feel truly supported here, loved um, by this church. So praise God. Now let's go to God's word. This morning's sermon is focused on what true freedom is, freedom in Christ. 
And I want us to look at Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4. As we see uh, God the liberator, we also see that something comes with liberation, with freedom. There's a rebuilding, there's a, a newness with these freedoms we have. So Isaiah 61, starting in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Let's go before our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and gathering us together. We thank you that... You've called us redeemed through the work of your Son, pouring out of his blood on the cross for us. Our salvation is found in him alone. So, Lord, we now ask that you draw our hearts and our minds, our attention, our passions towards you. May we cry out with a pure heart as we cry out in songs of praise and in our prayers. May we enjoy and, and be refreshed by hearing your word. Give us energy this morning to live as redeemed people in Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Church, let me invite you to stand as we sing together this morning.
seated. Our second reading this morning comes out of Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. We must recognize as humans that we all fall under some authority. Uh, And we see here that outside of Christ, we were slaves to sin. But in Christ, we have a new master, uh, a gracious master, a wonderful master, our Lord. And as we live as Christians, we must fight against our former slave master, sin, and follow obediently after our Lord and Savior. Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Let's once again go before our Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you as redeemed people. We cry out to you confessing our sins, confessing that we have rebelled against you, recognizing that our our passions and our thoughts have, have drifted away from you at times. And Lord, we ask for forgiveness. And as we confess our sins, we also rest comfortably in your arms knowing that you have forgiven us. Lord, we rejoice in this truth. We rejoice that our sins are washed away, that they've been paid for by Christ, and we now have peace with you. Lord, in this reality, give us wisdom and strength and a passion to proclaim this gospel to the world. Lord, we pray that we see the lost come to faith in Christ. We pray that you use us as a church and as as individuals to proclaim the the gospel that sinners can become saints through faith in Christ. That the rebels can become children of you. That your enemies can find peace with you through Christ. Lord, we pray for the loss of of Jarrettsville and Hartford County, Maryland, the United States and around the world. We pray that they see the light of the gospel, that the Spirit transforms their hearts, pulls out the heart of stone, and gives them a new created heart of flesh given from you. Lord, we pray that we live lives that reflect this truth. We pray that we continue to strive after obedience and wisdom in you. Lord, we also pray for the the hurting amongst us. Those that are sick, we pray for healing and strength comfort in their time of discomfort. Lord, for those that are hurting emotionally and spiritually, we we cry out for comfort for them. May they know that you are a God of comfort. May they know that you are a God that is near. Use us as a people to love them well. Use us to, to care for them. May we point them to you constantly. Lord, I ask as we hear the preaching of your word this morning, that it washes over us, that we we rest in it, we enjoy it, we see the glory of who you are. We see the true freedom we have in Christ. Restore in us the love we have for you. Restore in us the love we have for one another and give us the zeal to live in that new life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to sing together.
be seated. Our offering, offering passage comes out of Acts chapter 11, verse 27. It reads, Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. It's one of the things we do with our offering here. Is, uh, there's, there's many things we, that God has blessed us with, but one of them is that we are able to help and support our brothers and sisters around the world that have physical needs. Um, so recognize that that's part of your offering, is you are supporting the church around the world. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you that you have given us the finances that we have. Lord, may we now submit to you. May we give joyfully, knowing and trusting that you use this for your kingdom work throughout all the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> in which we'll examine this morning come out of John chapter 8 verse 31 through 38 John 8 31 through 38 I highly encourage you that if you have a Bible you have access to one please open up the word we are preaching from the word we are a church that values and trusts the word of God and this is why we gather together it's to, to worship God uh, through singing, through prayer, but also through reading and the preaching of his word. So, This morning we'll be talking about the freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ. Another title you could put is, this is the true freedom that every person through all of history has been seeking for and needs to have a happy life. So I'll stick with freedom in Christ, right? But we must recognize that the whole life we have is bound to someone. It's bound to something. And what I'm calling us, what Scripture has called us, what the Lord has called us to, is that we will find true and everlasting freedom in Christ alone. So join me as we read John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, <clears throat> If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son re remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Now we recognize the intense interaction that's happening between some Jewish believers and Christ. These believers, we should not assume, are uh, redeemed by faith in Christ. They just believe that Jesus really is there. He's really preaching to them. And there's some idea that they, they probably do believe that 
uh, he's of value. They should be listening to him. But they don't quite believe. They're not all the way there. They don't see and understand who Christ really is and what he has really come to do. And when we see, it starts with the Jews who had believed him in verse 31. And then it ends in verse 38. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. It's talking about the killing of Jesus. So let's not go into this passage and just assume that the men Jesus is speaking to are saints. We actually see that the belief is of just a head knowledge or just a, maybe there's some political power and value in listening to Jesus right now, but it's not belief that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus saves sinners, that Jesus has come to live and to die and reign as Lord forever. That's not the belief we ha- uh, these Jewish men have right here. And we must ask ourselves the same things. Do you believe in Jesus? Is it just a head knowledge? Is it just uh, you were raised in the church, you know all the stories, you know all the facts? Uh, do you believe Jesus? Because it just appears as though, you know, if, if following Jesus makes you happy and, and it seems to be more peaceful than being a Muslim, is that enough? Is that belief in Jesus truly what saves us? Or do you believe that you are a sinner? A sinner who deserves the just punishment of death and separation from a holy God? Do you believe that the only way to solve this problem of sin is that Christ has come to live a perfect life, truly God and truly man? That he went to the cross, dying on the cross, for your sins, bearing the price that you deserve to pay, that your sins were paid for on the cross, he died and was buried and rose from the grave. Do you actually believe that he resurrected from the dead, he ascended into the heavens, he sits at the right hand of the Father, being Lord of lords, King of kings, having dominion over heaven and earth? Is that your belief this morning? Well, friends, if it is, you know, you have tasted and seen the true freedom that is in Christ. But I fear, and I believe, that for so many, even some sitting in here this morning, you're seeking freedom in something else. The problem is, is that there is a draw to false freedom. We are all drawn in some way to a false sense of freedom. For us, in in this time, in this historical year of, of an election, There's probably plenty of people in this room outside the church that they're seeking freedom through a political movement. Right? Let's be honest. We all bleed red, white, and blue, right? We're proud Americans. Barrel-chested freedom fighters, whatever you want to put the title there. And we find our identity of freedom in our nationality. We found our identity of freedom in just the idea that we have a, a democracy. We can go and vote. We can pick who we want as our leaders. And sometimes we think that we have to get the perfect person in the political power to have true freedom, right? And then what happens in the next four years when that person rotates out and we think, okay, now we've got to get this person. This is where the true freedom comes. We have to have these political movements. Or maybe you're drawn to the false freedom of your finances. Financial freedom, right? Financial peace. You will find true peace and you will find true freedom once your budget is right. And that's why we continue to work and continue to work and continue to work. We're always hunting after this freedom we find. We we want this this comfort. I was told yesterday that I'm allowed to use this term as a financial nest egg. Thank you, Brian Akers. He kind of gave me the permission to say that. But we're always chasing this. And we think if we just get a perfect budget, we get the right paying job, and and we get the right balance in our retirement fund, we will have true freedom, right? But how often, how often do we see those that retire with the perfect amount die within a year of their retirement? Do they find true freedom? Even if they go on and live for another 30 to 40 years after retirement, Is that money the true freedom we're seeking after? 
Maybe you're looking for a false freedom at the end of, of the wars throughout the world. Right? Aren't we tired? And this is, this is a good thing that we hate and get tired of hearing and seeing war happening. We should hate and despise war happening between Ukraine and Russia. We should hate and despise war happening between Palestine and Israel. Why? It's because we see innocent lives being put to death. We should hate this. We should hate the shed of blood. But we think that maybe, just maybe, if this party and this army marches into the city, takes it over, we will have everlasting peace. Right? Wasn't that the promise we heard from the Great War? The Great War was once this war, it will end all wars. We then had to name that war World War I. Why? It's because we had a second war after it. And then we had many, many more wars after that. We're always seeking freedom in all the wrong things. We think this is our problem, and if we could solve this problem, we will then have freedom. And this is what we see the Jewish people doing here in our text. Look with me once again at verse 31. It says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, we th- we, we're rejoicing in that news, right? We think, yes, this is good. Look how the Jews respond. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So they're, they're challenging Jesus here. They're saying, what freedom do, are you going to give us? We're free men. We can put ourselves in that. What freedom are you going to give us, Jesus? We're Americans. We're free. And, and if you know it, just a, a minuscule of the Old Testament, you know that that's not true. Right? What, do we forget, do they forget that they were enslaved to, to Pharaoh in Egypt? And that God had to liberate them from them? From the, the, the slave master of Pharaoh? And, and then we have an entire book called Exodus about their enslavement and their liberation from Egypt? They're so short-minded. They, they can't remember that. They're just in the moment saying, we are free right now. We have no rule over us. We are free men. Do they forget about being enslaved to Babylon? I mean, read the book of Daniel. It's about how uh, Babylon marched down with an army, killed many of the people of Israel, kidnapped some of them, and enslaved the entire nation. Do they forget that because they're living in the moment? Friends, do we live this way? Are we just living in the moment? We're just hunting for the next freedom, or we're saying, no, we're good. We have that freedom. We, We already have it. But even if they forget history, these Jewish people aren't truly free. They're under the authority and the reign of the Roman Empire. Why are they lying to themselves and to Jesus that they are free people? Maybe they forgot about their ancestors. Maybe they forgot about history. But right now, in this time, when this was spoken by these men, they were slaves to Rome. They didn't have the freedom to do whatever they wanted. They, they didn't have the freedom to do and, and, and uh, have the lives they wanted however they thought was right. They were slaves to Rome. So they were lying to themselves. Friends, are we lying to ourselves? Do we fall for the lie that we're free men? We're free men and women because we're Americans. Do we lie to ourselves and say we're free men and women because you own your own house, you have a, a paid off car, and your retirement fund's looking good? Are you lying to yourselves that you are a free person because maybe you're the CEO of your business or you run your household? What lies of false freedom have you fallen for? Are we like the Jewish brothers here? They're saying they they are free, they're free men, they've never been enslaved, so what kind of freedom can they have? Well, friends, their problem is that they're looking at just the carnal just the physical, just the here and now of freedom. That's where their mind is going. But we must recognize and we must understand that this is not true freedom. Do not fall for the lie of humanism. 
This is one of the prevailing issues of our day and problems, and not just our day, it's been throughout history. But humanism, this is what the world is teaching us. This is what the culture wants us to believe, is that you will find true and everlasting freedom when you feel good. When you follow after your passions, when you follow after whatever makes you happy, that's what will bring you freedom. You know what that brings? It's brought it all throughout history. It's brought it all the way up to the day. It brings death. It brings death. Following after your passions and what makes you feel good will just bring death. And we see that's what the Jewish uh, believers were trying to do here. They thought they were good because they didn't have any rule over them. They were just following after what felt good at that time, after their passions, and they said there's no true freedom that we need other than this. So what is the true freedom? Friends, every one of us sitting in here this morning need true freedom. Those outside of Christ do not have this freedom. But the good news, the wonderful truth of the gospel, is that those that have faith in Christ alone have true freedom freedom. Now, do do we see that when people come to faith that wicked governments disappear? No. Do we see that when people come to faith in Christ that they have the perfect financial nest or egg that they can retire on? No. Do, Do we see that when people come to Christ in faith that they find freedom in their work and in their job that they become the boss and the CEO of their company? No. So then what is true freedom that can only be found in Christ? I'll put it this way. True freedom is is a spiritual freedom. It's a freedom from sin. It's a freedom from its guilt. It's a freedom from its power. And it's a freedom from its consequence. Let me say it again, and I'll put sin instead of its. True freedom is a spiritual freedom. It's a freedom from sin. It's a freedom from sin's guilt. It's a freedom from sin's power. And it's a freedom from sin's consequences. Brothers and sisters, this is the freedom we desire to truly have. This is the freedom that we should be celebrating, rejoicing in. But the hard part about this is that's not as physical and as tangible for us to see and touch, taste, taste. And feel. Right? So it's really hard for us to grasp onto this. You know, when, when we set off fireworks on the 4th of July to celebrate Independence Day, we can, we can understand that freedom. We, we can see that freedom that was fought for many years ago, and we understand and we celebrate it. When we have a good budget and finances that we can purchase really whatever we want, we see and we feel that freedom. When you're your own boss and have your own company, maybe you feel that freedom and you can see it. But here's the spiritual side. It's hard for us to see and understand. And our problem is we don't fully understand or recognize that we were enslaved to sin before Christ. You don't recognize your freedom because you don't recognize who your master was. Or if you're outside of Christ, you don't recognize who your master is currently. Romans 3.23, many of you have this memorized. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Universal language there. For all. Every single human being has fallen short of the glory of God because of their sin. We are all sinners. Since Adam, since the garden, since the fall, we are all sinners. I'm not pointing my finger and saying, look at you, look how bad you are. I'm holding up the mirror for all of us to look at and say, look how terrible all of us are in our sins. Let us see how all of us have rebelled against God. Let us see how all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. At the exact same time, we must see and understand that falling short of the glory of God comes with a punishment. It must. Falling short of a holy God must receive a just and righteous punishment. And we know from Romans that that punishment is death. It's an eternal separation from God. Friends, we can't comprehend on, in this lifetime what eternal and forever separation from God actually looks like. We get taste and glimpse of it in war, 
in, in abuse, in, in the terribleness of this world, in the fallenness of this world, we, we get a, a, a glimpse of it. But I don't even think that is a, a, a minuscule second of the eternal state of separation from God. Think about one of the worst moments in your life and one of the most painful things you've experienced. That's just a taste of what separation from God would look like. God uses death and wars and, and sin and the pain of sin to just remind us of how destructive and terrible sin really is. Friends, we must recognize the depravity of sin and we must recognize the punishment for sin. And we also must recognize that we are all guilty of that sin and deserve the just punishment. Let me just continue driving home this understanding of our need of true freedom. You can write this down if you're taking notes. It's a Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It's, it's arguably my favorite passage in all of Scripture, chapter 2, 1 through 10. But this morning, right now, we're looking at verses 1 through 3. Hear this language of Paul. He's talking to believers, but he's pointing them back to their past. It says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Easy question. Is being dead a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. Good answer. Good job. It's a bad thing. We know that from the physical death we experience on, on this earth. When people die, it's, it's painful. Even the saints that go into heaven, we still feel the pain of their death. So how much grander is the death of the spiritual. If we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So notice here, outside of Christ, you're just following after your passions. You're just following after the world. Is there, does that sound like freedom? Does it sound like you're really free if you're just following after the world? No, I hope you hear that you're just, you're just a drone. You're just following the person right in front of you. That there's, there's no real freedom there, but you think the world is lying to you. The world is trying to tell you that, oh, you feel how good this is? You, you have that feeling. It makes you proud. You have this feeling that, that you're just liberated. This is what liberation is. You can follow after your own passions. Those passions are just marching you down the road to hell and death. May we not fall for this lie. Verse 3 continues on. Among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. By nature, children of wrath. Friends, this is why we need true freedom. It's because by nature, each and every one of us is a child of wrath. Each and every one of us follows after the passions of the flesh. Each and every one of us has been enslaved to sin outside of Christ. Do you want to be a slave to sin anymore? I hope your answer is, is a renounding, renounding no, absolutely not. I hope you see the, the, the disgustingness of sin. I hope you hear the language that we are dead. We are short of the glory. We are separated from God. Do you want to be in that state anymore? Absolutely not. But what's hard is we can't fathom that in our earthly minds, in our flesh, in our passions. We can't fathom this. Could you imagine if we were in Annabelle himself in America, we'd walk down there and we went to a plantation and we walked into one of the slave bunkhouses and we said to them, brothers, Follow me, and you will find true freedom. And they said, no, this is okay. I like this. You see, we have a, we have a roof over our heads. You see, we, we have a meal. You see, this feels good to us that we can sit on our bunks and be happy. Come on, none of us are falling for that kind of story. You walk in there and say, brothers, follow me. There's, there's freedom. There's liberty out here. They're, they're fleeing. We saw hundreds of thousands go to their death in a war for such freedom. 
But here, when we understand true and eternal slavery to sin, we push it to the side and say, well, you know, I'll deal with that later. I like the feeling of that slave master now. How foolish we are for thinking that way. How foolish we are to think that our slave master of sin is a kind and gracious slave master. Absolutely not. Enslavement to sin is a guaranteed death. We need freedom in this way. It is a spiritual freedom from the we need the spiritual freedom from sin, freedom from sin's guilt, freedom from sin's power, and freedom from sin's consequences. So the question must be then, what is the way of freedom? What is the way of freedom? How do we do this? Look with me in verse 32 of our passage. Jesus tells them in the second part of verse 31, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jump down to verse 36, and it reads, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So if we're enslaved to sin, if we're enslaved to sin, we can't break free of it. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter uh, how many times you go to church. It doesn't matter uh, how, how many good deeds you do. You're enslaved to this sin. How are we free? What is the way of freedom? It's in the truth of the gospel. And that gospel truth is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Freedom is found in Christ alone. Freedom is found in Christ alone. We can look at Jesus' own words later on in John chapter 14. Verse 6 says, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the way to freedom. I am the truth, the truth of freedom, and the life. The life of freedom. And he doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, this is an option. Notice the definite article, the, the, the. And just in case you're not good with grammar, he makes it abundantly clear. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Brothers and sisters, do you want to find freedom this morning? Go to Christ. Believe in him. Not just in a head knowledge. Not just that you know the stories, not just that you, you've experienced the church life, but do you actually believe that the only way to freedom is through him? Do you actually believe that he died on the cross to liberate you? Do you actually believe that he reigns as king, and now you live as free persons in his kingdom? He is the only option we have. The problem with the political movements is politicians die. Politicians are faulty people. Amen? Maybe you didn't hear me. Politicians are faulty people. Even the best party. The best party still has a sinner in its leadership. Now, there's still a decision to be made there. Don't hear me that, oh, now we flee. But this can't be our solution. The problem with the, the financial solution and finding freedom in finances is that you will die. And your finances aren't going into the afterlife with you. It's not like if you become really rich on earth, you get to march into heaven throwing your shekels to everyone. And, and, and all the riches of this world won't do you any value as you're separated from God in hell forever. What's the problem with uh, the, the idea of maybe we can find freedom if we just end the wars? Well, has it happened yet? No. H has wars just ceased? Probably not. I don't know. I'm not in the army anymore, so I know they were not going to win. Just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, Lou, for laughing. <laughs> yeah, we, this isn't our solution, right? This can't be the solution because wars just continue. So what must the solution be? Maybe I'll work hard. What about this solution? I, this, is, this is a tempting one, I think, for us. What if we just stopped sinning? Right? That's a good option. And sometimes that's the gospel we are, we are preaching to the world. Just stop sinning. Stop cheating on your spouse. Stop stealing in your finances. Stop lying to your boss and be a good person. 
But what happens to that person? A, they can't truly stop sinning in their own strength. But even if they physically stop sinning, what happens is the heart is still corrupt. Right? We still have the spiritual issue. The enslavement we have is a spiritual one, so the only answer must come from God and his freedom in Christ. If you doubt me, we can go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8, we see this just clear as day, that the only answer, the only solution to our problem is Christ. How does it happen? If, if Christ is the answer, we must ask ourselves, how, do we, how does Christ solve this problem? Is it that we, we can spell his name and write it down on a test? Is it that uh, we just go to church? Is that what's going to solve our problems? Is that how Christ answers our problems? Ephesians 2.8 gives us the answer. For by grace, through God's gift to you, you have been saved. How? Through faith. By faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. So friends, how, are, how is Christ our Redeemer? How do we understand and see that Christ has brought liberty to us from our sins? It's because we have faith in him. Please hear that the faith is not your wisdom. The faith isn't that you got so smart. Your faith isn't that you got so strong in your physical strength. Your faith isn't that you just answered all the world's questions and now you have faith. The faith is also a gift from God. If I, I can't get away from it in Scripture. For by grace, grace, gift, you have been saved. So this is a, a passive action through faith. And this is not your own doing. Whose doing is it then? It's God's. May we rejoice in this truth. That the gift of salvation is from God and it's to a sinner, a rebellious people like you and I. And we get to live and celebrate and worship and enjoy true freedom from sin, its guilt, its power, and its consequences. Praise God for this gift. It's only through a perfect sacrifice in our place. And this is why Christ had to die for us. If you doubt me even more, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9. We'll go old school with it if you doubt. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. May we hear the freedom that comes from Christ alone. And as we're reading this passage, may you hear the freedom that is a spiritual freedom, and we're going to see how it overflows into the physical lives we have. Isaiah 9, verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they were glad when they divided the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Listen to this Christmas passage, but we're missing the liberator that has come. Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Do you want to find true freedom? It's in Christ alone. It's a spiritual freedom from your sin. But notice this. This is the last point. Notice this, that there is a life of freedom. How then shall we live? A true and everlasting freedom from sin overflows into the physical world that we live in. Do you want an end to war? I hope we do. Turn to Christ. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to the lost. Preach the gospel to the wicked rulers of the nations. Trust in God. We, we see that there is a physical action happening there. There's been a spiritual redemption of sinners from, the, 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 from sin, from its guilt, from its power and its consequences. 
Does that change how people live their lives? Absolutely. Christ has come, just hear these names once again from Isaiah. He shall be called, this is Jesus, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Do we want to see the end of wars? Do we want to see the end to and true, have true fr political freedom? Turn to Christ, have faith in him, and call the political leaders to turn to Christ as well. Call them of their sin and call them to repent and turn and have faith in the true Lord, the true King of Kings. Do you want freedom in this life? You must turn to Christ. How then shall we live? How does the life of freedom look like for us? Let's go back to our passage in John. We see a few things here. We go all the way back to the first verse, verse 31. It says, "You, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the first aspect of the life of freedom is that we know God. And, notice this, we abide in his word. So often we want to say, come to Christ, become a Christian, and then just go do whatever you want. You're free. Go be free. And go live however you want. But this is what Romans tells us, right? And we read it earlier that, that the question Paul's dealing with is, okay, if we're free in Christ, does that mean we can just go do whatever we want? God's, God's law and his commandments have no meaning to us? And what does Paul say? By no means. Our liberation from sin has brought us into the kingdom of God. Our liberation from sin has put us under the authority of God, and that's where we find true freedom. We should rejoice in this. We should abide in his word. I'm a bit preaching to the choir here, but this is why we gather together on Sundays. It's why we gather together so that we can abide in his word as a corporate body. But it can't just be here. If you're, if you're abiding in the Word is just a, a, a Sunday morning for 45 minutes, it, there's a lot more abiding that can happen. Are you studying the Word of God? Are you cherishing it? Are you, are you asking questions? And I know some will sit in here, well, I'm just not a good reader. It's not my thing. Uh, we live in a world of technology that you can have the Bible read to you. May we not abandon the Word of God because in the Word of God we find truth. In the revealed word of God, we find the revealed Christ who has revealed true freedom to us. And, and we see it continue on in, in verse 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Are you living by this truth? This is how we live as free persons, is that we live in the truth of the gospel. We live in the truth of Christ as our Savior. But it continues on. We can't just... Leave it, okay, the only freedom we have is that we read the Bible and we value it. No, there's so much more freedom that comes from this. Look in verse 37 with me. I know, and this is Jesus speaking to the believing Jews, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Do you see why that belief isn't true belief? Salvific faith? That belief they had was just a, an ideology. It was just a, a moment in history that they were following after because they seek to kill him. Jesus knows what they're going to do to him. So what does this mean for us? Why do we care about a life of freedom? Are you living in a way that resembles the spiritual death of Christ? Are you living in a way that you are spiritually trying to put Christ to death because you hate his work, you hate his commandments, and you hate what he is and what he has done for you. Are you following after your passions? Are you saying in one side, yes, I'm a Christian, I go to North Hartford Baptist Church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and any other opportunity I have to go there, I am a Christian. And then the rest of the week, you're just following after your own passions. You're joyfully and abundantly just committing sin. Aren't you just following after the Jewish people here saying, oh yeah, we believe we also want you dead. We also want you out of our lives and have no meaning there. Christ is not the king of your lives only when you gather together at church. Christ is king of this world and of your lives every single second that you have breath in your lungs. 
How about you live that way? How about we recognize this reality? But he continues on in verse 38. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Are we following after Christ? Are we following the commandments of God? How do we know the commandments of God? Through his word. The life of a Christian is full of freedom. And that freedom is rooted and grounded in Christ. We see here that we are called into his household, his kingdom. And often the world will say, see, you're not really free. See, that Christianity is all these rules, all these do's and don'ts. And you have to follow that. And brothers and sisters, I'm crying out to you saying that's where you actually find freedom, is that you're living in obedience to the created order that God has designed us to live in. You're living in the house of God. You're living in his kingdom. Are there rules? Absolutely. And joyfully, we follow after those rules because we're following after our master, Jesus Christ. Don't fall for the lie of the world saying, see, Christianity is an oppressive religion. You've got a whole bunch of rules. I can point to the world and say, look how many more rules that you have. Look how many more rules you have to follow. Make sure you say the right things to the right people. You may get fired. You may get kicked out of your school. You, you, you may lose your privileges to communicate. Or, oh, oh, you have to follow after your passions. And, and every time you do something that makes you feel good for the moment, the very next morning you wake up and you still desire more. Is there freedom there? Don't fall for the lie of the false freedom of the world. Find true freedom in the, the wonderful and beautiful arms of our Father through the work of His Son on our behalf. And live in it. The way of freedom is a life of joy. The way of freedom is a life that is seeking after the Lord. The life of freedom is one that recognizes that sin has no grip on you anymore. Oh, sin, where are you? Oh, sin, where's your, where's your strength? Oh, sin, where's your power? He's dead to us through Christ. The guilt of sin, are you guilty anymore? If you're in Christ, absolutely not. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. There is no guilt. A guiltless person, a person that is truly forgiven, lives in a world proclaiming their freedom. A guiltless person lives in the world with no shame. You don't have to sneak around and worry that maybe, maybe there will be some uh, uh, accusation brought against you. You're free in Christ. Confess your sins. Be free. A free person lives in the knowledge and understanding that sin has no power over you. Look, this is one that we are all continuing to grow in our understanding of. This is part of the sanctification that, that the Spirit is doing within us. Because when we're faced with sin and temptation... It feels really powerful in that moment, doesn't it? Aren't we just drawn to it? Let me just follow after it. If you are in Christ, you have the freedom because you have the power of the Holy Spirit to fight against that sin and that temptation. That temptation is not more powerful than the Holy Spirit. Now, we are all growing in this, brothers and sisters. Hear me. I'm not saying I am perfect by any means. Far from it. But we must... Recognize, remind ourselves, remind each other that we each have the power because sin does not have the power. And lastly, we live in a way of recognizing and remembering that we are free from the consequences of sin. You have life. Now, not, not just now, not just for the next 50 years, but in Christ you have an eternal life. You will enter into glory, a.k.a. heaven, but glory, and you will spend that glory forever with our Lord and Savior. In a new physical body. The, the Christ will raise the dead. We will have a new and everlasting body. It won't be broken. It won't be corrupted like our current bodies are. And we will live and worship and celebrate and rejoice in the lives we have with Christ forever. And we should start living that way now. May we live lives on this earth celebrating the life we have in Christ, proclaiming it to the world, calling the dead to put off their shackles, calling the sinner to break the chains of their sin and their master through the faith in Christ and find true forgiveness in him. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you that 
while we were sinners, while we were dead in our sins, we found forgiveness in Christ. That he came and died for us. And Lord, we now ask that if anyone in here does not know this truth, the Holy Spirit pierces their heart open, reveals their sin, and shows them, and pours out the grace of faith upon them. Lord, those that are in here that have faith in Christ have received and enjoyed that blessed gift. Give us the strength and the knowledge of how to live this out in our lives. In the every aspect, from how we love our spouses, how we interact with other brothers and sisters, how we interact with our coworkers and our bosses and the world around us. Give us the strength to live out our freedom. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as we sing and praise the Redeemer who has set us free. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you. reminder that tonight, if you're able to join us once again for service, is at 6.30. We'll continue our series through the life of David. Children and adults that want to sing, go downstairs immediately following this. And if you're a guest here, uh, we'd love to get to know you and meet you, so please come talk with myself or Pastor Matt. Or if you just have any questions or need to respond in any way, we're both available after the service. Now, our benediction out of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>